Helen walked down the street, her feet barely moving. Recently, the elderly woman had received some money, so went to the nearest supermarket to buy potatoes, pasta, milk, flour and sugar. Although the bag had not been a burden for Helen before, it was heavy now. In her youth, working in the cowshed, she used to pull hay with a pitchfork and carry huge boxes and buckets filled with milk or water. But now she was over sixty years old, and age had taken its toll. Her back often ached, and her arms had weakened, so she struggled to drag the bags from the supermarket, taking slow breaks to catch her breath. A few passers-by tried to help her, including two teenage boys with school bags, a middle-aged woman, and a young, tall guy. Helen politely declined their assistance with a smile. She wasn't in a rush, and these kind people seemed busy with their own affairs. So why bother them? Helen walked slowly, not only because of the heavy bag, but also because she didn't want to go home. The place she was returning to could no longer be called her home. It was just a refuge. She used to have a spacious, bright and cosy house with a large kitchen. There was a vegetable garden and a carved gazebo, which her father had built. Her favourite friends and neighbours were nearby. Helen lived well there, despite the hard work. Most of her life was spent working in the farm's cowshed, taking care of the animals. She tried her best to provide everything her son needed. She would leave before dawn and return after sunset. Her back, arms and legs had been aching back then, but she remembered those times with nostalgia. She felt much happier than she did now. Suddenly, November's cold rain started to fall. It came unexpected, drizzling down as if someone had opened a faucet of ice water upstairs. Helen hurried on. The rain continued to intensify, accompanied by strong winds, and it was clear to Helen that she needed to find shelter and wait it out. The elderly woman hurried to the porch of the nearest store, seeking shelter from the rain. Some people had already gathered there, waiting for the rain to stop. Cheerful children saw the sudden downpour as another adventure, while frowning adults were frustrated by the delay it caused. Helen's attention was suddenly drawn to a young man standing with his back against the wall. He had bright turquoise eyes, well-defined cheekbones, and wheat-coloured bangs that did not fall onto his forehead. He was a handsome young man, likely attracting the attention of many girls. He reminded Helen so much of Mike, a guy she had known for just two days in her life, almost four decades ago. Yet she vividly remembered every feature of his face, his scent, and the words he used to say to her. Mike, if he were still alive, would have long forgotten their casual acquaintance. He had many other admirers. And he wasn't aware of the role he played in Helen's life. She was born into a family of a tractor driver and a milkmaid. At just two years old, she became the eldest child, with another daughter named Angela following. Despite their modest lifestyle, the family lived decently, without starvation or tattered clothes. Helen's parents worked hard, so she and Angela learned early on to take care of the household. Helen reflected on modern children who, in her opinion, were overprotected by their parents. She and her sister were already washing floors and cooking meals at the age of six or seven. They took care of the yard and livestock, completed their homework and laundry without reminders. Despite their responsibilities, the girls still had plenty of spare time. After finishing their tasks and homework, they would happily join their friends outside. All their peers lived similarly, balancing their time between home, school and playing with friends. Helen and Angela were always supportive of each other, maintaining a strong bond. Unlike her younger sister Angela, Helen didn't excel in school. Angela effortlessly grasped everything, be it complex formulas or history. It seemed like everything naturally clicked in her younger sister's mind. For Helen, schooling felt like an insurmountable challenge throughout her studies. She tried her best, always completing her homework and never slacking off, but she couldn't measure up to Angela, and their parents took immense pride in their youngest daughter. 
Maybe at least someone from our family will pursue higher education, their mother dreamt. You'll succeed in life, daughter. You have a sharp mind, their father reasoned. It would be foolish to miss such an opportunity. Give it your all, and we'll support you. Helen was proud of her sister too, but her parents' words hurt her a little. Did that mean her parents didn't count on her? Did they not expect anything good from her? Was all hope only placed on Angela? Angela was a good girl, and she always helped Helen with her lessons, whenever she faced an unsolvable task. Time passed and the sisters grew up. Helen went to study in the city. She chose a practical field, sewing. She had always been skilled with her hands and knew she would make a good tailor. Great choice. Her parents approved of her decision. That's a decent speciality. You won't be left without a means to earn a living. We're wishing you success. After graduating, Helen decided to stay in the city. She found a job at a tailor shop, rented an apartment nearby, and started taking on freelance sewing work. Although the pay at the tailor shop wasn't substantial, the additional part-time work was helpful. Whether it was altering a dress, tailoring a coat, or sewing tablecloths and curtains, Helen always had work and money. Meanwhile, Angela pursued a law degree at the university. Oh, how their parents' eyes gleamed with pride when they spoke about her to acquaintances. They were glad about their eldest daughter, Helen, who was hard-working and skilled, but their younger daughter was the one they truly beamed with pride for. Who could blame them? Angela was intelligent, beautiful, and studying at the university. Helen genuinely felt happy for her sister, She accepted that it wasn't her destiny to excel in academics, but she knew her hands were gifted, and everyone acknowledged that. Time flew by. Helen's friends got married and started families, but things just didn't fall into place for her. The men who liked her did not attract her, and the men she liked preferred other women. It was a paradox. Whenever she heard that a friend or former classmate was getting married, Helen felt worried and anxious. Her parents added fuel to the fire. Every time she visited them, they bombarded her with questions about marriage, having children and settling down. Helen felt almost desperate. She started viewing every guy around her as a potential spouse, evaluating them solely from that perspective. Unsurprisingly, this obsession didn't go unnoticed and drove men away. And then there was a dance party in the city park. Helen went there with her girlfriends. She didn't particularly enjoy dancing, as the loud music always gave her a headache, but she hoped to meet someone at the dance. Helen wanted the same, love, a husband, a child, and simple human happiness. She dressed up her best dress that highlighted her good legs, curled her hair, applied makeup to her lashes and lips, and, satisfied with the result, she left the house. Helen didn't have high expectations, as she had attended dances once every two or three months without any luck. But that evening, that evening, turned out to be entirely different, unusual, magical, and amazing. Mike initially noticed one of Helen's friends, the blue-eyed beauty Kate, and approached them to introduce himself. While he seemed to address everyone, his eyes were fixed on Kate. Helen realised she had fallen in love when she saw the stranger's turquoise eyes. They looked cheerful and mischievous, with a slightly sly squint. And his smile, it was enough to drive her crazy. Mike was a witty and funny conversationalist, confident and unembarrassed, unlike many other guys. Helen would have given a lot for Mike to show the same interest in her as her friend. But Mike invited Kate to dance, not her. Helen watched them with envy from around the corner. She saw how the guy tried to hold Kate tighter than was socially acceptable. His hands kept slipping below her waist, making Kate uncomfortable. After another dance, she slipped out for the fresh air, and Helen understood that her friend was just scared of Mike's advances so she found an excuse to leave as well. Mike hurried after Kate, but Helen intercepted him. Just then, 
slow music started playing. Shall we dance? Helen smiled at him, making a desperate and bold move. She had never behaved like this before, but it felt as if she was being guided. She felt relaxed and confident, with no doubt that Mike would agree to dance with her, and he did. For a moment the guy looked at Helen, confused, as if trying to remember who she was. Of course, when they first met, Mike only had eyes for Kate, but the second time he smiled radiantly at Helen. Her heart raced and her palms immediately sweated as he extended his hand to her. During their dance, Helen melted in his warm embrace. When the music stopped, he slightly kissed her. It wasn't Helen's first kiss, but it was the first time she had such a reaction. She felt dizzy, and her eyes darkened. She wanted Mike to hold her like this for the rest of her life. She didn't care that he was kissing and hugging her in front of everyone. Let them look. Let them be jealous. She didn't care what they thought. Shall we go for a walk? Mike suggested it in a hoarse voice. Helen eagerly agreed. She also wanted to be alone with him. They wandered through the night city, hand in hand. Mike talked about himself and asked Helen questions about her life. When he learned that she lived alone, he suggested going to her place. Helen agreed without hesitation. Throughout the evening and night, Helen had been imagining herself and Mike as a married couple, deeply in love and planning to spend their lives together. She enjoyed being near him and taking care of him. Mike was already asleep, and Helen lay in bed looking at the ceiling and relishing in the feeling. The warmth of her loved one, his peaceful breathing, and the silence and tranquility. Helen was completely in love. She had never experienced such strong feelings before, and she didn't know she was capable of feeling this way. The young woman didn't know much about Mike. He mentioned that he lived in another city, but didn't specify which one. He came here to visit a friend, someone he served in the army with. This friend recently got married, and Mike was his best man. Helen believed that they had met each other for a reason, and now Mike wouldn't go anywhere, and if he did leave, he would probably take her with him. In the morning, Helen woke up to the sounds in the kitchen. The scent of scrambled eggs filled the air. She stretched in bed and smiled, remembering the events of the previous evening. It was Mike preparing breakfast for her. How wonderful and romantic! Before meeting her lover, Helen looked into the bathroom, washed her face and smoothed her hair. She applied a touch of lipstick and pinched her cheeks, adding a subtle blush. She wanted to appear in all her glory before Mike. Indeed, he had cooked scrambled eggs. Good morning, the man smiled when Helen entered the kitchen. I've been acting here, like at my place for a bit. Is that okay? I was just hungry. That's even better, Helen said, radiantly smiling. So romantic. Let me woo you then. With these words, Mike took out a plate, deftly seized a piece of scrambled eggs on it, and sprinkled it with greens on top. Helen, mesmerized, followed his every movement. Her heart beat joyfully in her chest. At last she had met her man. And what a man! Handsome, intelligent, attentive, caring. The young people ate breakfast in silence. Mike was obviously thinking about something, and Helen did not want to distract him. Thank you for the evening. The man finally broke the silence. But now I have to go. I have to stop by my friend's place, pack my things, and go to the train station. The train will be here soon. Helen felt as if she had been hit on the head with a sandbag. How could this be? Is he already leaving? What about her? They were so happy together. Are you really leaving town today? Yes, didn't I tell you? Mike was surprised, and then suddenly smiled with his charming smile. Yeah, well... We didn't really have much time to talk yesterday. I thought you would stay. I would love to. You're great, really, but the train's in three hours and I've got plenty of things to do. Will we meet again? Helen fought hard against the tears welling up in her eyes. She had already realised everything, guessed it all from Mike's looks and his tone. Everything turned out to be her illusion. Their feelings, sparks... 
Mike had not planned anything serious from the very beginning. Helen herself invented an unearthly love and a fateful chance meeting. And for him, she was just another girl for a good time, pleasant and non-committal. Helen did not make a scene. She took herself in hand and put on an indifferent look. She didn't want Mike to think that she considered him more than a casual acquaintance for the evening. She didn't want to appear pathetic in his eyes. However, Mike still seemed to notice something. "'Are you upset?' he asked, and something like guilt seemed to flicker in his eyes. No, Helen couldn't be angry with him. He hadn't promised her anything, nor had he lied to her. Now, there was a kind of genuine concern for her. A little, the girl smiled. I thought we had at least another evening to spend together. Mike hugged her and gave her a kiss on top of the head. If I had another day, I'd spend it with you. That's for sure. But I've got to go. It was a pleasure to meet you. Mike went away. Time passed. Life returned to its normal course. Helen worked, met with friends, read, watched TV, and went to the movies. She visited her parents. In general, she led a familiar life. However, she often remembered Mike. She imagined how their relationship might have turned out. And she also dreamed. She dreamed that one day he would drop everything he was doing and rush to her to confess that he missed her, loved her, couldn't live without her. Of course, Helen realized that this would never happen. But the sweet dreams made her feel pleasant and light-hearted, and she didn't deny herself in them. A month and a half later from that memorable night, Helen suddenly realized that she was expecting a child. One of her co-workers was eating a fish for lunch, and the smell coming from her plate made Helen feel sick. Yes, so much so that her vision darkened. At first, Helen tried to find an explanation for her situation. Her cycle was probably disrupted by this nervous situation. After all, she had a hard time breaking up with Mike. Nausea was also probably from nerves. Or it was the results of the diet. But a few more weeks passed, and it became impossible to ignore the symptoms. Helen went to see a doctor who confirmed her fears. Pregnancy is in its third month. Helen was in shock at the news. However, after suffering for several days in a row, Helen could accept the situation. She would try her best to give the baby a good childhood. She had a good profession, and her parents would definitely help her if anything happened. They were loving and reliable. So the baby would be fine. After that, Helen finally felt in a calm and began to enjoy life. At the same time, Angela got a degree. Not only that, but she was also invited to work abroad in a large company. This was incredible in Helen's eyes. Her little sister had reached such heights. A dizzying career, interesting work. Recognition awaited her, while Helen would soon become a single mother. Her parents were only talking about their youngest daughter's upcoming departure. They were proud of Angela again, and they had no idea that soon their eldest daughter would make them happy by becoming a single mother without a partner. Against the backdrop of her sister's success, Helen's own life seemed like a complete failure. Soon, Angela moved away. She called her parents and sister occasionally and sent letters with enclosed pictures. Helen saw that her sister had changed. There was a hardness in her face that made her even more beautiful and attractive. A beauty. A clever girl. A dream. And Helen had her own life. A few months had passed, and now it was impossible to hide the pregnancy. Everyone at work guessed, and her boss began to criticise Helen's work in every possible way, and constantly hinted that he would not be satisfied with her work because a single mother would constantly take sick leave. Who would do her work, then? All this disturbed Helen. She realised that she was going to be fired. Yes, pregnant employees are protected by the laws, but there are always loopholes to be found. And so the boss found one. One day, he simply closed the atelier, making it cease to exist. As a result, all the female employees lost their jobs. 
but it was only for one day, because the firm was bankrupt only on paper. In reality, it continued to operate without interruption. The very next day, the boss rehired the dressmakers, except for Helen and some other women with small children. They were of no use to the boss. Helen was left without a job and means of subsistence. She didn't even have money to pay the rent. She had nowhere to go, so Helen had to return to her parents in the village and confess everything to them. Mother and father, of course, were surprised to hear their daughter's story, but they were not particularly upset. On the contrary, they seemed reassured. Don't worry, we'll get through this. The father reassured. Stroking Helen's head like a little girl, we won't lose. Not this time. Everything will be fine," echoed the mother. "You'll give birth to a baby, and we'll help you raise it. Children are happiness." The parents didn't seem bothered by the upcoming difficulties or the inevitable gossip from the neighbors, and Helen understood why. They had a successful younger daughter. Even Helen's life mistakes paled in comparison. To Angela's achievements, on one hand, it made life easier for Helen; on the other hand, it made her feel even more significant and foolish. It was frustrating, painful, but too familiar. Jeremy, Helen's son, was born on his due date. As a new mother, Helen spent hours gazing at his red, wrinkled face, hoping to see a semblance to Mike, his father. She wished for her baby to inherit his father's handsome. Charming and charismatic traits. However, Jeremy did not have the same deep turquoise eyes or an open smile that formed dimples in his cheeks. He was just a typical boy, short, thin, with black hair, resembling his grandfather. Nevertheless, Helen adored Jeremy. The moment she saw her baby, she realized that her actions and her life would be solely for his sake. During Jeremy's infancy, Helen received support from her parents. It was necessary, as the state payments were minimal, and she had no husband or savings. But as soon as the opportunity arose, she took a job as an auxiliary worker in a cowshed. Jeremy was still too young for kindergarten, so he stayed with his grandparents, who adored him. Helen worked hard because she wanted her baby to have the best toys, beautiful clothes, and the chance to travel. The work in the cowshed was physically demanding, requiring her to work in two shifts to earn a decent wage. With the money she earned, Helen started taking Jeremy to the city every weekend. They would visit cafes, go on rides, watch movies, and of course, visit toy stores. Helen often allowed her son to choose whatever he wanted, even if it meant sacrificing her own comfort. She worked tirelessly to see the happy gleam in her son's eyes. Sometimes Helen's father would shake his head and say, "You spoil him. You shouldn't do that. You've completely forgotten about yourself, and everything you care for is Jeremy." But you're still young. Helen would shrug and reply, "I don't need anything. The main thing is for my son to be happy. It's your time for your son to learn to work. He can't wash his plate or clean his room. You and your grandmother do everything for him. You're raising a spoiled child." It's not good for a man. Helen's mother would quickly come to Helen's defence, saying, "He will have plenty of time to work in due time. Let him enjoy his childhood." The elderly man had no choice but to give up. However, decades later, Helen would realise how right he was. Blinded by love for her son, she failed to notice many things, but the consequences of her actions were waiting for her. Jeremy, although intelligent, was a lazy boy. At first, he quickly grasped everything at school and excelled without much effort. Helen had hoped that he would take after Angela, who held a prominent position and published in professional magazines. However, no one can rely solely on intelligence and memory throughout their school years. It was time for Jeremy to work harder, to learn, to understand complex formulas, and to put in effort. But Jeremy had no interest in any of that. Problems started to arise: low grades, frequent absences, and a general unwillingness to attend school. Jeremy argued that in today's world, 
a person could get a good job without education. It broke Helen's heart to see her son waste his abilities and not make use of his talents. The grandfather tried to discipline his grandson, however it was too late. For Jeremy, there was no more authorities. He got involved with a bad crowd, teenagers from less prosperous families. Helen tried to talk to her son, to bring him back on the right path, but her efforts were in vain. Jeremy believed he knew better, and he often quarrelled with his mother. "'What can you teach me? You live impoverished. You don't have a proper education, and you spend your days shoveling manure on the farm for pennies. I don't want to live like you, so you're not a decent example of life example.' Helen had nothing to say to her son. She could only hope that he would grow up and wise up. The year in which Jeremy was to finish school brought Helen many losses. First, immediately after the new year, his father died. He had long been coughing strangely and had difficulty breathing, but attributed it to a lifetime of smoking. It turned out to be his heart. He had a heart attack in the morning, and Helen couldn't even get him to the hospital in time. After Jeremy's grandfather's death, he completely lost control. The elderly man had kept him in check a little bit, but now the boy's behaviour became wild. He would disappear at night with new friends, come home drunk, and demand money for entertainment from his mother and grandmother. Jeremy became rude, harsh, and completely distant. Neither persuasion nor threats had any effect on him. Helen, who was still grieving for her father, felt like she was losing her son as well. Only his mother gave her hope with her words that the boy would get through this phase. He's growing up without a father and it's hard for him, but he'll come around with time. He'll definitely calm down. I've seen many similar cases in my lifetime. And indeed, by the middle of the year, Jeremy had suddenly matured. He finished school and his grades were pretty good thanks to his mother's efforts who had given gifts to the teachers and school administration at the end of the year. Jeremy seemed to suddenly appreciate all that his mother and grandmother had done for him, and he even asked them for forgiveness. Helen's heart sang. Her mother was right. Jeremy had changed as he grew up. I've decided to go to the city and study welding. Oh, that's a great profession, his mother and grandmother chorused. They would have been happy with any choice Jeremy made. The most important thing was that he realised the importance of education. He would learn, get a profession, and have a stable life. Jeremy left, easily got into the technical school, and started his independent life in a student dormitory. Helen breathed a sigh of relief. Everything seemed to be back to normal. And then, another blow came. Her elderly mother fell ill, and soon she was admitted to the hospital with bilateral pneumonia. Helen felt tense, but not overly frightened. Pneumonia was serious, there was no doubt about it, but her mother was under the care of doctors in the hospital. The woman didn't think about the worst, but one morning she received a call from the hospital with terrible news. Her mother had passed away. It happened suddenly during the night. It felt like Helen's world had been shattered. She was left alone in this cruel world, with a difficult life and a difficult teenager. How she wished Mike was by her side now. She still remembered the father of her child with tenderness and love. Helen longed for a reliable shoulder to lean on in this difficult situation, but there was no such person. Angela was far away, and although she would come to say goodbye to her mother, she would soon fly back to her own life, full of events and excitement. And Mike... He probably didn't even remember Helen. She wondered how his life turned out. Surely he was happily married and raising children, not even suspecting that he had another son in need of his attention and care. Time passed, and Helen gradually adjusted to her new life. Her son left to study in the city, and she continued to work two shifts to provide for all of Jeremy's needs. The boy needed clothes, food, textbooks, and extra classes. He also needed money for leisure activities. After all, it was his time as a student, and life in the city was expensive. 
During this period of her life, Peter, a former classmate and now a widower, began to woo Helen. He worked as a driver for the administration. Back in high school, Peter used to chase after Helen with flowers and compliments. It was funny how she remembered him, self-conscious, ridiculous and somewhat anxious, but also touching. At that time, young Helen dreamt of guys like Mike, heavy, stylish and smart. Peter, on the other hand, seemed too simple. He was short, puny and wore glasses. Of course, Helen enjoyed the attention from the boy, boosting her ego, but she never considered anything serious with him. Time passed, and Peter transformed from an ordinary teenager into a good man. He married Beth, a girl one grade below Helen. Helen and Beth were childhood friends, not particularly close, but they often went for walks together, socialised and shared secrets. Peter and Beth's family was exemplary. They were both calm, hard-working and polite. It was difficult to imagine them raising their voices at each other or their children. They had a son and a daughter, and their house was full of love, prosperity and abundance. Helen was happy for her childhood friends. Unfortunately, the marital happiness of Peter and Beth was short-lived. Beth, young and seemingly healthy, suddenly fell ill. She grew pale, thin, and weak right before their eyes. Peter took her to hospitals trying to help. They discovered a complex genetic disease, but there was no cure. The doctors could only offer a disappointing prognosis, differing by a few months. Beth couldn't be saved. As a result, Peter was left alone with their two children. The whole village supported the inconsolable widower. At first, Helen even cooked dinners for the orphaned family, but then Peter took over the household. He slowly raised his son and daughter, helped them stand on their own two feet, and provided them with an education. Both children now worked and lived in the city, but Peter didn't rush to move closer to them. He still had elderly parents to take care of in the village. When Jeremy went off to study, Helen noticed that Peter was increasingly around. He would offer her a ride home from work, engage in conversations about various topics, and help her carry her bags from the store. It seemed like he was always coincidentally crossing her path. Helen enjoyed his pleasant company. They discussed the news, reminisced about their childhoods, and laughed together. One day, Peter mustered the courage to have a serious conversation. It was clear that this step was not easy for him. Helen, you know I've always liked you, he confessed. Well, when was that? Helen smiled, not realising what Peter was getting at. She thought they were just reminiscing about their childhood again. It was a long time ago, Peter agreed. Then he looked at her seriously and added, but nothing has changed since then. Helen looked at him questioningly, not knowing what to say. However, the unexpected confession made her feel good. Goosebumps ran down her back, warming her heart. I've always had a soft spot for you ever since childhood. Since sixth grade. I mustered the courage to confess in high school, but you turned me down. I pretended not to care, but I really suffered. I would secretly admire you, get jealous when other guys were around and dream that after finishing school I would study, become successful, and come for you in a cool car. Then you wouldn't be able to resist. Helen smiled. The confession seemed naive and sweet. Peter smiled too, reminiscing about his young and ambitious self. But it didn't work out, he continued. I couldn't get into university. I wasn't smart enough. I ended up studying to become a driver and returned to the village. Of course, I heard about you from acquaintances who said you were living in the city. They mentioned you had someone, but I never doubted it. You were such a beautiful girl, and you still are. Helen couldn't contain her laughter. Peter, living in the village, mistakenly believed that she had many suitors in the city. Little did he know, Helen suffered from loneliness and was desperately jealous of her married friends. You have no idea how wrong you were she exclaimed. Yes, I was a young fool, Peter grinned. I thought I had missed my chance. What was I? Just an ordinary driver, and you? You were a princess, a queen, 
an unattainable ideal, we weren't a match. Back then, Peter felt a deep emotional pain. The girl he had loved since childhood would never be his. It seemed as though there was nothing left to live for. He went about his daily routine, working, eating and spending time with friends. The world appeared dull and meaningless. Then unexpectedly, Peter discovered that his neighbour Beth had feelings for him. The girl, who had transformed from a skinny teenager into a lovely girl, finally caught Peter's attention. With her big clear eyes, thick long hair and slim waist, she had a certain charm. Beth had completed her studies at a pedagogical college in the city and returned to her small hometown. She was now a teacher, working with first graders. One evening, as Peter returned from work, Beth took a decisive step and approached him at the gate. She poured out her feelings, leaving Peter dumbfounded. I was stunned, Peter recalled with a smile. It was unexpected, but I also felt sorry for her, as I had been in the same position. I realised how much she hoped for my attention and how important it was to her. I knew that my indifference would crush her. How could I do that to the fragile, love-struck Beth? They began spending time together, getting to know each other better each day, and soon they realised they were a wonderful couple. I thought that nothing good would ever happen in my life, Peter said, and then she, she pulled me out of my shell and showed me that happiness was still possible. We got married, and then, then you returned to the village, confused and pregnant. How I wished I could support and encourage you, but it was too late. Beth and I were married and we had children. Did you still love me then? Helen asked, surprised. Of course, and even now, I love you too. But at that time I couldn't express my feelings. I had obligations to Beth and our children. I loved them all. I couldn't betray my family, even for my own happiness. Were you unhappy? Helen wondered, deeply moved by Peter's revelation. I can't say, Peter responded. Beth was wonderful. I loved her in my own way and took care of her. I was content with her. But towards you, I can't even describe what I felt and still feel. They sat in silence for a while. Peter looked at Helen, waiting for any sign from her. But the woman struggled to understand her own feelings. She was pleased to have someone who loved her so deeply. It warmed her soul. Peter was a loving, devoted, good and reliable man. However, something held Helen back. What about Jeremy? she pondered. How would he feel about this situation? He probably wouldn't approve, and would think that his mother had lost her mind in old age. However, the desire to be with someone who cared gradually overwhelmed her. Helen thought about how wonderful it would be if they could live together. Peter would undoubtedly be happy, and the realisation that she could bring so much joy to someone else was satisfying. On the whole, that same evening the former classmates decided to try being a couple. Well then, I'll take you out tomorrow, Peter concluded with a smile. My youthful dream will finally come true. Will it? Helen nodded with a hint of hesitation. The next day they went to the city. They strolled through the park, talked, ate in cafes, and even went to the movies. During the film, Peter took Helen's hand and held it for a time until the end of the movie. She didn't object. She enjoyed the feeling of not being alone any more. A week later, Peter moved in with Helen. He immediately fixed the leaking faucet and tightened the hinges on all the interior doors. Finally, they no longer creaked. Helen began cooking again. When she was alone, she rarely bothered herself with it. But now that Peter was with her, she delighted in preparing delicious meals for him. Helen had a burning question in her mind. How would Jeremy react to all the changes in her life? She didn't know yet. Her son rarely visited her, and their communication was mainly limited to phone calls. So Helen kept the recent changes in her life a secret from Jeremy. As for Peter, he had already told his son and daughter about Helen, 
and the woman noticed that they were happy for their father. Years went by, and Helen never found the courage to have a serious conversation with Jeremy. It was easy for her to hide the details of her personal life, as her son showed little interest in her affairs. He usually called just to ask for money, but one day Jeremy surprised her by showing up at her doorstep. Helen greeted him with a mix of joy and confusion. Hello, she said, pleased yet slightly taken aback. Peter was still at work, but his belongings were scattered around the house, making it obvious that someone else was now living here. Hello, Jeremy responded gloomily. He didn't look well, slouched, pale, and anxious. I need money. Helen immediately sensed that something serious had happened. What's going on? She asked. Her heart pounding. Is it something related to your studies? I haven't been studying for a while, Jeremy muttered under his breath. Why? Just because, the son replied rudely. I got expelled for skipping classes. I've been working hard to make ends meet, but I've been sending you the majority of my salary every month. Helen reminded him. That's nothing in the city, Jeremy sighed. I couldn't make ends meet. So I did what I had to do. My friends' parents are well off. They have cars and apartments, and they give their kids money for entertainment. But what about me? I feel like a pauper all the time. Do you think that's pleasant? Helen was deeply hurt by her son's words. She had dedicated her whole life to providing the best for him, wanting him to have every advantage, and now he thought he was unhappy. It seemed. That she had failed in her duty as a parent. So what's the problem? Helen asked. I've gotten into debt. Jeremy began to explain. I wanted to start a business to make some money, but it backfired, and now I owe a lot. They're threatening me. I have no idea how to get out of this situation. That's why I came to you for help. Son, you know I don't have anything. Helen said. What do you mean you don't have anything? Jeremy was surprised. What about this house? Do you really want us to sell the house? Well, what's the alternative, Mum? I'll use the money to pay off my debts, rent an apartment, and we can live together in the city. Why not? Besides, you can get a job at the sewing factory in the city. Grandma told me you used to be a dressmaker. We could live together in the city. It'll be great, won't it? Helen couldn't agree with her son's proposal. A couple of years ago, she would have gladly supported Jeremy's idea. Living alone in an empty house had become unbearable. But now, now she had Peter. They were good together, and it was comforting to have a loving and understanding person by her side. So, what should she do? Jeremy finally noticed the men's belongings in the house. Peter's jacket hung on the wall. His sneakers stood near the front door. What's all this? Jeremy asked, looking at his mother in astonishment. Do you have someone else here? I've been meaning to tell you for a while, but yes, I'm not alone any more. I see. The son shook his head and sighed sadly. Well, of course, you have no son to worry about any more, right? You know that's not true," Helen softly objected. She could see that Jeremy was in a state of depression. He was facing problems and needed help, and as his mother, she was going to lend him a helping hand in this difficult moment. Son, I'll do whatever you say. And Helen did exactly that. She sold the house and gave most of the proceeds to her son. With the remaining money, she bought a tiny apartment on the outskirts of the city. Peter offered various options and even wanted to give Jeremy his savings, although it was far less than what Jeremy needed. It was still a considerable amount, but Helen refused. She didn't want Peter to solve their problems. Besides, he had his own children to take care of. It would be despicable to take advantage of him in such a situation. Then stay with me, Peter suggested. Helen had already packed her things at that time. And the suitcases were in the hallway, waiting for tomorrow morning. Jeremy had ordered a cab for his mother by ten o'clock. You know I can't, 
Helen whispered. I know, but I don't understand. You gave him money and bought a place to live. But why would you want to be there yourself? Stay with me. I've got a big house with plenty of room. You know. We had a good time together, didn't we? Yes, I was happy with you, agreed Helen. For these few years that she had lived with Peter, the woman got used to warmth, care, acceptance. They often walked together in the evenings and discussed something. Peter looked at Helen with loving eyes, and she felt happy. But now, now everything was different. Helen saw that her son was not well, too anxious, too restless. Something bad was clearly going on in his life. Yes, Jeremy was an adult, and Peter was partly right when he said that he should deal with his own problems. But when Helen was in a difficult situation, she didn't deal with her problems on her own. Her parents helped her a lot. Peter tried to convince Helen that there was a huge difference between a young single woman with a child in her arms and a grown man, to whom his mother gave money from the sale of the house. But Helen couldn't agree with him. It was good for him to talk so calm, because his son and a daughter were working at good jobs and had families. There was no telling how Peter would have acted if one of his children had gotten into a situation like Jeremy's. And also, Helen was afraid of losing her last home. Now that she did not have the house in which her childhood had passed, the woman began to worry from old age. It would not be long before she would be elderly and perhaps helpless. How would she live without her own corner? Anyway, she had to find out what was going on in his life. Maybe it's time to save her son. He won't admit it himself, but when they start living together, Helen will understand everything. She'll see for herself. She can't leave her only child alone with his problems and troubles. Well, why are you so worried? Helen smiled at Peter, but the smile came out sad. The woman understood that even without a mirror. I'm not moving to the moon or even to another continent. The city is near. Distance is not a hindrance to real feelings. We'll meet. We'll communicate. We will, of course, Peter sighed. But you realise it's not the same thing. What can you do? Life happens that way. Helen moved to the city and enthusiastically took up the arrangement of the new dwelling. There was only one bedroom in the apartment. It went, of course, to Jeremy. Helen settled down in the living room. Peter often visited her at first. They walked along the embankment as before and sat in cafes. With him, Helen felt invaluable, important and loved. Peter kept asking her to move in with him, but Helen could not leave her son now. After living with him for a while, the woman realised that Jeremy had a serious drinking problem. He drank a lot, coming home only in the morning. His mother lay awake, worrying. What if someone beat him up, or he was hit by a car, or even taken by the police? Meanwhile, Jeremy drank more and more, and he degraded literally before her eyes. He became stupid, aggressive, and helpless. Helen blamed herself, and who else could she blame? It was her fault that Jeremy's childhood had passed without a father, and besides, maybe Mike, Jeremy's father, was a drunkard, and Helen heard that addiction to hot drinks was often passed on by genes. And now Jeremy was suffering because of his careless mother. Helen tried to make her son's existence as easy as she could, feeding him on her own money, and generally becoming a servant for Jeremy. He did nothing at all around the house. He only demanded things. Before the man began to live with his mother, he was still trying to work, but now he was completely relaxed. Indeed, why bother, if, all the same, he will not stay hungry? Mother bought groceries and cooked lunches and dinners for several dishes. So Jeremy didn't bother himself with constant work, and after some time, he began demanding money from his mother whenever he didn't have enough for a drink. Feeling sorry for her son, Helen initially gave him money, but then she realised what he was spending it on and stopped. However, sometimes Jeremy still managed to take money from her purse, 
and other times he resorted to threats and rudeness. Helen felt unhappy and confused. Life with her own son had turned into a nightmare. Jeremy would yell at her, talk back to her, and take her money. Helen's only solace was going for walks with Peter. He would visit her in the city whenever possible. She didn't share the details of her life with him because it was embarrassing and difficult. She couldn't confide in anyone about her misfortune. In front of others, Helen put on a mask of serenity. One day, Peter shared some news with Helen that deeply pained her. I'm moving soon, he said, gazing into the distance. And, to my great regret, we won't be able to see each other often. Helen shrieked. Where to? Peter was the only person who made her feel better, and now it turned out that their meetings were coming to an end. To the sea, he replied. I have lung problems, and the doctor advised me to change the climate. My son and his family are moving with me. My daughter is still considering it. That's the plan. I will miss you very much, Helen said sadly, trying to hold back the tears. Helen, I beg you, come with me. You helped your son when he was in a difficult situation. Now he'll find his own way. And he's not a little boy any more. And what about you? You deserve some happiness. We'll live by the sea. Think about it. But Helen knew she couldn't leave and abandon her son. Peter didn't know anything about Jeremy's addiction. How could she enjoy the sea, sun, and company of Peter, knowing that her son was suffering alone in a distant city? Peter left, and Helen struggled with his absence. They called and texted each other, but it wasn't the same. Peter sent photos of beautiful landscapes and continued to invite Helen to join him, but she felt she had to be there for her son. Several more years passed. Jeremy continued to drink and refused treatment. He started bringing his drunk friends home, which was even harder for Helen than waiting up at night for him. These people, rough-looking women and degraded men, would laugh loudly in Jeremy's room, drink, swear, and sometimes even fight. When Helen tried to reason with her son, he snapped at her. Then Deborah, Jeremy's girlfriend, came into their lives, and, unfortunately, there was no hope that she would have a positive influence on Jeremy. Deborah herself had a penchant for trouble, and if Jeremy typically didn't bother his mother, except when he needed money, Deborah would often confront and argue with her. In the end, Deborah turned Jeremy against his mother. He now believed that she wanted to cause problems between him and Deborah, and that she generally hated his girlfriend. Scolding, quarrels and scandals became a daily occurrence for Helen. Thoughts of her sad life were swirling around in Helen's head, and meanwhile the rain had subsided. Helen took advantage of the break to head towards her home. This time she hurried, in case it started raining again. When she got to her floor by foot, as there had never been an elevator in this old apartment building, the elderly woman stood at the door like a stumbling block. Her suitcases, the same ones with which she had moved here from the village, were on the landing. Helen opened one of them. There were her things lying in it. It was strange. The elderly woman tried to open the door with her key, but it didn't work. Helen knocked loudly, since the doorbell hadn't worked for a long time. The door swung open, revealing Deborah standing on the threshold. She looked happy, with a smile on her face. "'What does all this mean?' Helen asked. "'You're just leaving, you old hag,' Deborah announced it in a subdued voice. "'This is my apartment. Why would I leave?' "'It's not yours. It's Jeremy's. It's registered under his name. I saw the papers myself the other day. You're nobody here, so guess out.' After these words, Jeremy's head appeared from behind Deborah. Yes, Mum, that's what we've decided. You need to leave. You haven't given us a normal life. 
You keep interfering all the time, meddling in things with your advice. You even want to cause a rift between Deborah and me. Therefore, it's better for us to live separately. What will you live on? Helen asked calmly. She had long realised that her son didn't have any warm feelings for her, but he needed her, at least as a source of funding. You know nothing, Deborah smirked. I am expecting a baby. I'm due in a couple of months. I'll receive my maternity pay, and then I'll receive monthly payments for the baby. So, we'll be fine. Helen glanced at her figure. Yes, her belly was noticeable under the soiled sweater. But Deborah had never been particularly slender, so Helen didn't notice anything before. Poor baby. How will Deborah and Jeremy raise him? And will the baby even survive? The news about the child overshadowed the fact that she was being kicked out of her own home. She felt unbearably sorry for this unborn baby, her grandson or granddaughter. At the same time, Helen realised that she couldn't save the baby or make his life even the slightest bit easier. She couldn't even sort out her own fate. So, get out of here, Deborah said it arrogantly and smiled triumphantly again. But son, where am I supposed to go? Helen turned to Jeremy. Do you want me to live on the street? You have a suitor in the village, go to him. Jeremy waved her away carelessly. You have somewhere to go. Don't pretend to be poor or helpless. Of course, Jeremy didn't know that Peter had moved a thousand miles away from here. And you also have a rich sister. She won't leave you behind, Deborah added and slammed the door. Helen picked up her suitcases and went outside. What should she do? She didn't have a single thought in her head about where to go. Peter was far away, and her sister Angela was even farther away. Nobody needed her. She was lonely, abandoned, and now homeless. And she was ashamed to tell people that her own son, for whom she had only lived, had kicked her out of the house. Helen walked for a long time. The rain had stopped, but the icy wind continued to blow, burning her cheeks and making her eyes water. It was rapidly getting darker, and there were hardly any people on the streets. Finally, Helen couldn't walk any longer. She placed her suitcases near an empty bus stop, sat on them, and let the tears flow. They streamed down her cheeks, and she didn't even bother to wipe her face. She cried for her unfulfilled hopes for her son. She wept for Jeremy's addiction, and the sad fate of her unborn grandchild. And, of course, she wept for her unclear future. Hi, is something wrong? A pleasant young girl's voice came from somewhere behind her. Helen turned around sharply. A tall, thin young woman was looking at her. She wore tight jeans, sneakers and a deep hooded sweatshirt. Her eyes were attentive and sympathetic. Next to the stranger, a funny little pug was visibly worried. He whined in an amusing manner and seemed to gaze sympathetically at Helen. Its happy face looked so comical that the elderly woman couldn't help but smile through her tears. Valerie was born into a family of students. She had no memory of her parents. She saw their photos and listened to stories from relatives and their friends. That's how the image of her mother and father was woven into her mind. They were cheerful, energetic, hard-working, a little naive, and deeply in love with each other and with their child. The tragedy occurred at a construction site, Valerie's mother and father, trying to earn some extra money after their studies, were looking for side jobs. That time they managed to find work with a private company that was building a sports complex in the city centre. The young couple, along with a couple of other students, were painting the walls when something went wrong. Either the cable broke or the platform failed. In any case, all four of them fell from a height directly onto the concrete floor the owner of the construction site managed to escape the consequences. The students were working for him unofficially. He made it appear as if the young people had sneaked onto his construction site to take extreme pictures or something of the sort. After the funeral, Aunt Laura showed up. 
The woman lived in the village, raising her three children alone. They were not poor, but their family couldn't be called wealthy either. Taking in an orphaned niece was a burden for Aunt Laura, but she couldn't abandon her brother's child and send the girl to an orphanage. The neighbours would scold her and remember it for the rest of her life, and of course, her conscience would torment her as well. That's how Valerie ended up in Aunt Laura's family. At first glance, the girl's childhood seemed ordinary. Valerie helped her aunt with household chores, played outside with friends and went to school. But there were no birthday parties with many friends and a cake with candles, no nice dresses or trips to amusement parks. But that wasn't the only thing. Valerie missed the simple warmth, hugs, affectionate words and support so much. Aunt Laura was not strict or angry, but she was in no rush to surround her niece with love and care. Her own children were a different matter. Aunt Laura treated them quite differently, stroking their heads, hugging them, and finding tender words for them. But Valerie, she always felt like a stranger to her aunt, and as she grew older, she realised that she was a burden to Aunt Laura. Growing up with the realisation of her own insignificance was difficult. The girl dreamed of growing up and having her own family, where she would be truly loved and appreciated. Valerie always spent a lot of time studying. At first, she enjoyed learning new things, and it turned out that she was excellent at it. She was an excellent student throughout all the years. Secondly, Valerie understood perfectly well that education was her only chance for a better life. The girl wanted to leave the village, settle in the city, and travel the world. For all of this, she needed money, so she worked hard. After finishing school, Valerie went to university to become an interpreter. She was given a dormitory, and her independent life began. Finally, she was not a burden to anyone. Valerie didn't pay much attention to boys in her youth. She had firmly decided for herself, career first, then everything else. But in her final year of study, the girl accidentally met Aaron. He was eight years older than her, self-established, self-confident, handsome, and intelligent. The man had come to the university to find intelligent interpreters for his own travel agency. Aaron opened the door, took a step into the hall, and crashed into Valerie, who was passing by. The man immediately caught the girl, preventing her from falling, and began to apologise. Valerie assured him with a smile that she was fine. She was amused by the man's behaviour. He acted as if he hadn't accidentally bumped into her shoulder, but he had nearly hit her with a car. And then, like a scene from a soap opera, their eyes met, and Valerie's breath caught. Aaron obviously felt something too. A spark passed between the young couple. They talked a little and exchanged phone numbers, of course. In the evening, Aaron picked up Valerie and they went for a walk around the city. The girl herself chose this format for their first date. Soon, relations between them became close and very serious. The girl moved into his spacious apartment in the centre of the city. At first the girl was frightened and confused by the fact that her partner was so wealthy. He had his own travel agency, a fancy car and an expensive apartment. And who was she? An orphan from a village. But Aaron was not bothered by any of this. He looked at Valerie with admiration in his eyes and showered her with gifts and compliments. The girl saw that her mere presence made him happy and she allowed herself to be happy without any worries. After a while, Valerie realised that she was expecting a child. It was unexpected and happened too quickly. Aaron was genuinely happy. His business was doing well, his wealth was growing, and his business was expanding. Children are happiness, smiled the man, gently stroking Valerie's still flat belly. Valerie thought that after sharing the news of her pregnancy, Aaron would finally propose to her. But he did not rush to take her to the registry office. When she asked him directly about legalising their relationship, Aaron sincerely expressed surprise. Why do we need all this fuss? Well, a child should have a complete family, a mother and a father. 
Oh, this. I will legally acknowledge the child, don't doubt that. I consider marriage is just a formality. You know, I was previously married, and the relationship soured right after we got married. There was so much trouble with document reissuance and so on, so I am against such formalities. His favourite statement bruised Valerie, but she managed to accept Aaron's point of view. After all, did a stamp in the passport really matter? The most important thing was that they loved each other. Eva was born on time, which made Valerie the happiest person on earth. The young mother couldn't take her eyes off her daughter, and couldn't understand how they had been blessed with such a miracle. Aaron was not a very attentive father. Even since the baby was born, he has somehow become distant. But Valerie, blinded by the new happiness of motherhood, didn't notice. One day, when Eva was just two years old, Aaron announced that he was leaving. I'm leaving the apartment to my daughter. I will support her for life and maintain a relationship with the child too. But I can no longer live with you. I'm sorry. I fell out of love. I met someone else. It happens. Aaron left, leaving Valerie in disarray. She felt like half of her heart had been ripped out of her chest. She loved Aaron so much, and had hoped that everything would be fine. But now she had to adapt to a new reality. First, she needed to find a job. Valerie had given birth to her daughter right after finishing university, and hadn't had the opportunity to find work. Now, with a small child in her arms and no work experience, who would hire her? Especially since she had no one who could take care of Eva while she was at work. Of course, she could send her child to daycare, but Eva would often get sick there, and employers are unlikely to appreciate an employee who frequently takes sick leave. The situation seemed hopeless. On that November evening, Valerie pondered her future, trying to figure out how she could find work. They didn't have enough money to live on, and she didn't want to ask Aaron for more. He had already left them an entire apartment and provided money for their daughter's support. At that moment, the pug that Aaron had given Valerie before their daughter was born whimpered. The dog asked to go outside. What a bad time! It's dark and cold, and there are puddles all around. It had just rained. But what to do? The dog can't wait. Eva was already asleep in her room. She would wake up only in the morning, so Valerie could take the dog for a walk. The young woman quickly dressed, attached a leash to the pug's collar, and went out into the dank November evening. From afar, Valerie noticed an old woman sitting on her suitcases near the bus stop, and she couldn't believe her eyes. It was a strange sight. She approached, looked closely, and realized that the elderly woman was quietly crying, not even noticing that her face was already wet with tears. Valerie's heart squeezed with pity for the stranger. Who was obviously in big trouble. What's wrong with you? Do you need help? After hearing Helen's story, Valerie was horrified. She had dreamed so much about her parents being near her. Therefore, she couldn't understand how Jeremy could do that to his mother, his own mother. Without hesitation, Valerie provided a suggestion that came out of her mouth before she had time to think it over. Come to my place right now. Otherwise. You'll have a cold. You can't stay outside. A year had passed since that meeting. Helen stayed with Valerie. On that cold, dark evening, over a cup of hot tea, a decision was made that suited both participants in the unusual story. Helen now looked after the house and was happy to babysit Eva, who considered the elderly woman her new grandmother. Valerie calmly went to work. Knowing that her little girl was in safe and loving hands, finally, Valerie had someone who truly loved and cared for her. From Helen, she received the maternal warmth that she had lacked all her life. One day, Jeremy showed up. Somehow, he found out where his mother lived. He demanded that Helen return home, appealing to her sense of family. Are strangers more important to you than your own son? It happens," Helen said, shaking her head. "Now I know it for sure. 
Sometimes strangers are closer than relatives. And Valerie and I are not strangers now. Jeremy threw Deborah out. Their child was never born. Deborah, being pregnant, was not willing to give up her bad habits, and naturally her body couldn't handle it. So Jeremy crawled back to his mother. He needed her money once again. The man still didn't want to work, but this time Helen was firm. No, Peter was right. Her son was a grown man. She had done more for him than she should have. Let him handle his life from now on. After that, overcoming herself, Helen could eventually tell Peter the truth about her son. She immediately felt better, and Peter finally understood her. He came to Helen, met Valerie and Eva. The four of them quickly found common ground. Eva started calling Peter grandfather. He didn't object. On the contrary, it was obvious that he enjoyed it. I invite all three of you to visit me this summer, Peter said before he left. No refusal will be accepted. No refusal was planned. Helen smiled. Peter left. Valerie and Helen were making plans for a wonderful vacation by the sea. Peter and his whole family were waiting for them. It would be a wonderful vacation, and who knows? Maybe they would move to the sea coast. During the vacation, they would see how things went. Valerie would try to find a job, and they would take a vacation and get to know each other.